Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2013 film Evil Dead. And yes, it is the remake of The Evil Dead, which is probably why they left The off of it to kind of dif differentiate there. So um, just so you know, since it is from 2013, there will be spoilers in this review. So if you've not seen this and you want to see it without spoilers, go watch it. Then you can come back to this. Now, this one was directed by Fede Alvarez. I'm sorry, I'm sure I'm butchering the names, and I apologize. Fede Alvarez, who did films Don't Breathe and The Girl in the Spider's Web. Uh, written by Alvarez and uh, Rodo Saiguez. Say Say Once again, I'm sorry. Um, who also wrote the script for Don't Breathe with Alvarez. Uh, and Diablo Cody actually ended up doing revisions to the script because apparently because the two original writers were not, didn't have English as their first language, they wanted to make sure that things translated the best since the film was going to be in English. So it kind of makes sense that Diablo Cody then kind of, you know, did a pass at it. So that's good. Uh, it was produced by Rob Tappert, Sam Raimi, and Bruce Campbell. So yes, the original people had buy-in on this. They you know, had input with it, which is a good thing, which is why I think you got a relatively good remake. People do throw this in there when there's that, you know, debate that inevitably comes up in the horror community about, are there even any good f horror movie remakes? And yes, there obviously are ones like, you know, The Thing, The Fly, stuff like that. But um, Evil Dead gets thrown in there a bunch. And I, I don't know that I would say that it was, it's like a great remake, but it is a good remake. It's certainly, you certainly don't watch it and be like, oh man, they definitely should not have made that film. Uh, so that's, yeah, good for that. Uh, it had a $17 million budget and it ended up making $97.5 million. So cha-ching, worth the money, I guess, for the studio. The shoot ended up being 70 days long because Alvarez chose not to use CGI at all except just for some touch-ups here and there. So this, this is one of the things I love about the film. Overall, I like the film, but one of the things I love about the film is their um, commitment to using practical effects, and it just looks better. It always looks better. That's one of my soapboxes I like to get up on and say, you should always use practical effects, especially in horror, when you have the ability. Always go away from CGI because it's not going to hold up over time. Um, and even sometimes the year it comes out, it's not going to look that good. So it always looks more real because it is real when it's practical effects. So I love Alvarez's commitment to doing that. It, obviously, it meant it was more expensive and it was a longer shoot, but I think that's a big payoff with the film. The theatrical release actually ended up getting cut down to an R rating because it originally got an NC-17. So that's pretty nuts. Uh, there was an idea at one point to have Alvarez and Saigas uh, do Evil Dead 2, and then at the same time, Sam and Ivan Raimi do Army of Darkness 2, and then somehow come together in another film and weave the stories of Ash and Mia together, which I would have been interested to see where that was going to go. Obviously, we're not going to end up getting that. That idea has been abandoned at this point. But they did announce just this year that they will be doing another Evil Dead film called Evil Dead Rise, which is going to be taking place in, like, a city. So it's going to be a very different setting for the film. And I'm excited for that because as long as we're still getting entries that are done relatively well, I mean, I, at this point, I've now gone through all the Evil Dead films, which I have reviews for on my channel and I may even made a playlist for all of it, so they'll be there. Um, and there aren't any bad films. So if they keep doing it and there aren't bad ones, and this includes Ash vs. Evil Dead, the show, I'm, I'm for it. Uh, and apparently for this, this uh, Evil Dead Rise, uh, Sam Raimi's chosen Lee Cronin to be the director for it. And he directed the film The Hole in the Ground. That was an A24 film, which I haven't seen yet, but I hear visually it's really good, and story-wise it's it's pretty solid. So we'll see how that goes. Um, there will be no Ash, apparently, though, in Evil Dead Rise, which doesn't surprise me that much because Bruce Campbell had said before he has retired from doing Ash Williams, which it's sad, but, you know, he's he's earned his, his ability to retire, and at some point it was going to end, so... Here we are. 
So, to the events of the film, uh, there's some confusion about who's good and who's bad initially with this film because of the way they started. The way they started is basically Mia getting attacked by people in the woods, and they seem like kind of like your hillbilly type people. So, it seems something menacing coming at her, so it immediately puts you as an audience member in this viewpoint of, oh, something bad is happening to her. But then she gets tied up, uh, and they have everyone around her, and her father shows up, and you start to question things because then they're talking about, you know, her having the evil in her, you know, maybe being a deadite. They don't say deadite at that point, but, you know, no, knowing the storyline, you you know that's what they're kind of getting at. And then you just start questioning things. You're like, oh, well, maybe she is bad. Maybe these are good people and they're trying to get rid of the deadite in her. And then, but they do a good kind of back and forth of just really making you question up until the point and it's a really creepy and kind of scary point where Mia, or not Mia, where the character says, um, makes the statement of, um, what did she say? I'll swallow your soul. I wrote it down there. I'll rip your soul out is what she specifically says. But she says it in such like a normal, innocent way that it's more impactful when it hits you like that because you, your brain has to process it. Like the, the, the tone of how you initially hear it you hear it as something very, you know, blah, you know, it, it doesn't have impact. But then once your brain has actually processed the words, you're like, oh, and the, those things just don't match. Like the way it's being said and the message of the actual sentence don't match. And that's what's jarring about it. And it's a great moment. So that's the point where you understand, okay, now I know really what's going on. Uh, the shots of the woods in this look very, very beautiful. And the kind of journey that they take through it is great because it really helps to show you how secluded they are at that point. Even before the flooding happens and takes the road out, um, you you understand that they really can't get away at that point. Um, and help will not be coming. That's the other thing. So mention of Mia's previously failed sobriety attempt is a very important thing in this film because it gives real reason for their friends to not believe Mia when things start to actually happen. And also, it lets the audience know that the objective is to make sure everyone stays there, especially when they can't believe that what's going on with her is actual, you know, deadite things going on. Because first of all, they don't know about that stuff. They already think she's just losing it because she's getting off of drugs. So they did a great job of creating a believable scenario for the characters where the audience isn't like, why wouldn't they do this? Why wouldn't they do this? Um, there is a, a, a slight bit of that later on that I'll talk about, but for the most part, the way they set it up, it's very believable what's going on. And I thought they did a good job. Um, so I like that. The scene of Mia puking buckets directly into Olivia's face when, she, when Olivia's on the ground face up is an awesome scene. I think that's really fun. I love when there's like buckets of stuff, you know, like buckets of blood gushing or buckets of puke being spewed. I love scenes like that. They're just fun and funny to me. And I thought this played both ways. So I enjoyed it. Uh, the shot pulling up from Olivia's body laying on the bathroom floor and the music that goes along with it is very over the top. And that was a moment where I, I like, it took me out of the film because of how over the top it was. And this kind of speaks to one of the issues in general that I have with the film, which is the music, that soundtrack is too much. It's very, very heavy handed. It hits you so hard. It gets loud. It gets overly dramatic all the time. I'm more of a fan, and I know this is very much just a personal thing, but I'm more of a fan of really toning it down, making it a lesser score. And the way I look at the use of music in film is kind of the way I look at certain ingredients that can be strong in food if you like it like you like that on its own but when you add it in with the film it needs to blend instead of standing out or overpowering it and when it's a situation where I really notice the score and it takes me out of the actual events of what's happening on screen which happens in this film quite a few times in my opinion that's when I think the score is too much and it really needed to be toned down Yes, the music sounds great, but the level that they do it, it's just too much. It's its just overwhelming and not in a good way because it becomes distracting. And once again, it's like that food thing. You know, if you put 
if you love pepper, the flavor of pepper, but you put too much in with, you know, a chicken dish that you're making, you're going to taste mainly just the pepper. And that's what the music in this film does. When the music gets crazy and heavy handed, you're mainly just hearing the music and focusing on the music. At least I am. And it takes me out of the events of what's going on when those things just need to blend a lot better. You should not notice the soundtrack until the film is over and you're thinking about it, like thinking back, like how was the soundtrack? You should never be taken out of it and been like, and be like, oh my gosh, you know, this, this, this music is very strong and it's very loud. And so that's one of my biggest problems with the film. I think if the music was toned down a lot, I think it would have been better for building tension. I think it would have been scarier. I think there's a lot of power in allowing people to, have uncertainty because the music obviously tells you what they want you to feel like what what of what the events are supposed to be doing for you and i think there's a lot more power and ambiguity and how you can build tension with a horror film in particular through you know more dialed back music or silence even because the person's left with confusion like how should i be feeling what's going to go on right now but when you have that auditory cue that's telling you exactly how things are supposed to go there's no ability to really build tension because you already know what's going on there's no ability to kind of make people confused or i think it actually does a disservice to jump scares as well so i'm just saying my once again just my opinion i can smell your filthy soul that is a quote I laughed at. There's too much of a serious tone for a comedic injection like that into the film. And especially because that I smell your filthy soul line came in at like halfway through the film. And there was like really nothing that was intentionally funny up until that point. And it felt like that line was supposed to be intentionally funny. And it didn't jive. It didn't match. If you're going to have comedy to it. You need to introduce that very early to let people know this is how it's going to be. You can't just inject it later because it really takes people out of the film and makes them feel like it just doesn't, it clashes. It, it, it's like a speed bump on the road and you're just like, wait, what? The tongue bifurcation scene uh, with the box cutter is something that people cite all the time with this film. It is very iconic as far as this film goes. And it's a gnarly scene. It's really well done. This is one of those moments that I would point at and say, look, practical effects so much better than doing CGI for something like that. Um, that's not my favorite scene in the film, but it is a good scene. It's well done. The electric meat cutter scene might be my favorite gore scene, actually. And the reason for that being it looks very real the way they shot it. Also, the sound design that they use with it when she gets down to the bone and you hear like that crack, it is stress inducing, it's anxiety inducing, it is gross out. I cringed when I see that. Like when you see a scene like that, a gore scene like that, and you are like, ugh, because you can kind of feel it, it means it's done well. And so that, for that reason, that's one of my favorite gore scenes in the movie. Might be my favorite, but it's definitely one of my favorite. After all that's been experienced, it doesn't actually make sense that David would suggest that Mia just has some sort of mental illness manifesting. There was this whole time where he's talking with Eric and he's just like, oh, maybe she's just, you know, our, my mother had mental illness and I worried all my life that that would pass on to me and, you know, maybe it's in Mia. But with all the events that they've been through, it's not believable at all that he would bring that up at that point. Like, maybe it's this he's losing it moment and so he's in insane denial but it just doesn't fit the character it doesn't fit the events of what went on that is another thing that kind of took me out of it i'm just like why would he be bringing this up now because he clearly has seen that there's something else going on so it just didn't jive i thought that should have been taken out and you don't need it like you don't need it at all so they should have taken that one out it is ridiculous that after all the physical trauma, physical abuse that David and Eric sustain, they're at best just feeling uncomfortable. Well, at worst, just feeling uncomfortable. Like the fact that they aren't in like insane pain and almost unable to do anything or totally unable to do anything is very unrealistic with this film. And this film seems to go for a lot of realism. So they go through so much. They've been put through so much trauma, yet... They just, it just seems like, oh man, it, it's like I kind of sprained my ankle. That's basically it. They had nails shot through him. I mean, Eric in particular had his hand cut in half. 
uh, or bashed in half, I think, with the crowbar, I mean, you would be in crippling pain. Both of them would be in crippling pain. So the fact that, that the way it's acted is that they're just like, oh man, it kind of hurts, is another thing that doesn't make sense for what's going on. It, it takes you out of it, or at least it does for me. I do love the scene where David is burying Mia and the camera moves with the shovel uh, as he's shoveling dirt in. It's a really cool movement and motion of following uh, following it, but it makes it very impactful for the eventual reveal where, you know, uh, there's a plastic bag over Mia's head as she's laying in there being buried and her eyes are closed and then it moves over. You see her eyes closed and it moves back. Then it moves over again and you see that her eyes are open. That is such an awesome reveal. That's a great... Uh, trick that they do with with the camera movement and the shots I yeah I, I really dig that moment it works very very well uh, and after letting Mia down for so long David has finally been there for her and in the biggest way possible so I do think that that aspect had good impact of the brother not being there for so long which they worked on that aspect of the story slowly over uh, the first like half of the film I guess um, so it is a good payoff then because of all that, all those breadcrumbs they left leading up to it. It's a good payoff when he finally does the, the biggest thing he can do, which is basically like, I'm going to die so you can get out of here. Like it's the ultimate love. So it's impactful. It's good. It's a, it's a nice moment. I do like Mia also ending up losing her hand in this, just like Ash, uh, but in a different way. Like it is... Uh, she finds the chainsaw that's like ash and then when she has it you're thinking oh maybe you know maybe if if someone told you she also will lose her hand someone may say oh so they're gonna since it's a remake they're gonna do the same thing where she cuts her hand off to keep from you know the the deadite in uh, possession basically um uh, but i just like that it was you get the same end result of her having lost a hand but it's done differently i just like that touch to it Jane Levy, who played Mia, did an excellent job with this. That is a demanding role, a very demanding role, and she did a very, very good job with it. Uh, she deserves applause. She's been in other things like Don't Breathe, and she was also in a bunch of episodes of Castle Rock, which is really good. I've only seen the first season, but I like what I saw there. Um, so overall, lots of really good-looking movements from the camera. In general, directing really good, cinematography really good, the acting's really good. A lot of technical things. Obviously, I already talked about the practical effects. So good. Um, the gross, dark, and gritty look of it is extremely effective. Uh, I like that they went for that angle with it. It looks good for that reason. The use of light and shadows is very excellently done in this film. Uh, they kind of hit that sweet spot of not fully showing things, but enough for scares and gross outs to be really effective. Um, and there are those moments where you're just like, you're for a, a moment you're not sure what you're seeing and then you finally have just enough light to see what's going on and it's either gross or disturbing or whatever like their use of lighting in this was very well done they obviously really had a grasp on that um i already talked about the soundtrack thing but i do want to reiterate the soundtrack was too much uh, and the last thing I have to say about it is there's clearly a metaphor for drug addiction here being like a possession as drugs end up making the user a person who they are not usually themselves. So I thought that actually worked for the situation because if you think about it, drug addiction, alcohol abuse, stuff like that is very much like a possession. You know, when someone's drinking, when someone's high, people say all the time, that's not them, that's the drug. It is just like being possessed by deadites. And so for that reason, I thought it was a smart choice to use that. So yeah, I I, uh, I dig it. It's pretty good. So anyway, what am I going to rate this? With an overall of five stars possible and half stars in play, it's not an outstanding film. It is well done. Like I said, all the technical stuff is awesome. You know, obviously soundtrack issues and some of the stuff that kind of took me out of the film, but it is quite good. Um, I'm going to give it a three and a half stars total. So that's a pretty good one. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear other people's opinions down here. You know, agree with me, don't agree with me, whatever. Let's talk about it. So put your comments down there. But do me a quick favor if you could. Hit that subscribe button for me because that's your best way to repay me. If you like any video that I've ever done on this channel, please hit that subscribe because I don't make money doing this or anything. 
and legitimately when I see that a new person has subscribed, it makes me very happy. It gives me that feeling of validation where I'm just like, oh, someone actually enjoys what I'm doing. They appreciate it. You know, someone received this video, watched it, and it meant at least something to them. So I do appreciate that. But also, if you are going to subscribe, make sure you hit the notification bell because then you know whenever I'm putting up a new review video or when I'm live streaming or, you know, all that stuff. But regardless, I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. And until next time, keep it brutal.